online defense and security committee meeting. Uh, of course, we're all sorry that as a result of the pandemic that we're not able to be together. Uh, certainly, uh, we would much rather be uh, in Stockholm, and I want to thank our Swedish hosts who are hosting us virtually. Uh, I want to call the committee to order. Um, we have a short period of time today uh, in our schedule uh, to complete um, the review of um, our reports uh, and our guest speaker. Um, I would ask that when you uh, come online to speak, if you would speak uh, briefly so that we can, can move along. Our first uh, guest speaker will be from our host country, uh, Johan Lagerlöf, uh, who is the Defense Policy Director for Sweden. Uh, he will present an overview of Sweden's perspective of the evolving security environment in the Arctic. Uh, following that presentation, we will have John Manza, Assistant Secretary General for Operations at NATO. He will brief us on the Allied withdrawal from Afghanistan. We will then hear uh, from our General Rapporteur and Subcommittee Rapporteurs who will present their draft reports. The three draft reports are available online. You can find them along with the agenda of this meeting uh, here on the Kudu platform by clicking on the documents uh, button on the right side of your screen. For the rest of practical details, uh, please wear a headset uh, when speaking, both for the quality of your microphone and the sound. Uh, this assists our interpreters. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please click on request the floor at the bottom of your screen. If you encounter any difficulties during our meetings, please write in the operator chat box. The NATO PA staff will be there and try to assist you. Please also note uh, that this meeting will be video recorded and available on the NATO PA YouTube channel and the NATO PA website following the meeting. Uh, without delay, then uh, we'll um, proceed with the meeting. We have two items that we're going to adopt by acclamation. Uh, we're going to accept acclamation uh, as being if no one requests to speak to object. So. Um, uh, please hold your uh, requests to speak uh, during this time period unless you're objecting on these two items. Uh, the first is the adoption of the draft agenda. Uh, are there any comments or objections to the draft agenda? I'll pause for a moment. Uh, seeing that no one has requested to speak, we're going to assume that the agenda is adopted. Uh, next is the adoption of the summary of the meeting of the Defense and Security uh, Committee held on the 21st and 22nd of November 2020. It is, was our online annual session. If there are any comments or objections to this summary, please request to speak. If we see none, we'll assume that the summary of the meeting is adopted. I'll pause for a moment to see if anyone wishes to object. Seeing no objection, the um, adoption of the summary has occurred. Uh, next, we'll move along to our presentation by Johan Langerloff, uh, Defense Policy Director for Sweden. Um, he is going to be introduced um, by uh, Paul Johnson, a Swedish MP. Um, Paul, we, we appreciate uh, your being here and uh, Johan's uh, presentation. Uh, if you would please take the floor um, and uh, introduce Mr. Langerloff. Mr. Johnson, could you please request the floor to speak as well as Mr. Langerloff, and then I can bring you up to the meeting. And after Mr. Johnson's introduction, uh, Mr. Langerloff, if you would then uh, begin your presentation. Mr. Johnson should be coming up. I authorize both. Let me try again. Oh, here we go. Excellent. Gentlemen, we look forward to, your, to uh, the presentation. Yes, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Johnson, and I'm the chairman of the Committee on Defense in the Swedish Parliament. Uh, and it's my great privilege to introduce Mr. Johan Lagerlöf. Uh, I actually had the pressure, pleasure of knowing Johan Lagerlöf for well over 20 years, and we used to be colleagues before at the Swedish Defense Research Agency. Uh, Mr. Lagerlöf is the direct, uh, Defense Policy Director at the Minister of Defense, and he is also head of the Department of Security Policy and International Relations at the Ministry of Defense. He, in previous capacities, have served as a, a Defense Advisor at the Swedish delegation to NATO, and he's also been seconded to the Ministry of Defense in Helsinki. He's also an artillery officer by training, and he has served as a company commander in the 51st Arctic Brigade. 
uh, and in addition, he holds also a Master of Political Science at University of Uppsala. And Mr. Lagerlöf is going to be speaking about a Swedish perspective on Arctic security. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Turner, uh, distinguished members of the NATO Parliamentary uh, Assembly, Defense and Security Committee, and thank you to Paul for the introduction. Um, and thank you for uh, the invitation to join you in this digital session. Uh, I greatly value the opportunity to exchange views with you and to provide a Swedish uh, perspective on Arctic security. Um, and as Paul referred to in, in the 90s and early in, uh, in 90s of the conscription and reserve officers training, I served in one of the Arctic brigades. So I'm familiar with the environment by, by heart. Uh, and one of the tasks uh, we had was to, uh, after an in invasion from the east, uh, counter attack and cut off the Soviet supply lines in the northern parts of Sweden close to the Finnish border. Um, and after uh, the end of the Cold War, um, myself and I think many others saw this more as, as a curiosity for the history books. Um, but um, in many respects now we see a sort of return of geopolitics uh, in the north. So uh, it's a timely subject to address. Um, uh, and a brief glance at the map makes it clear that the Arctic, the Baltic Sea region and the North Atlantic constitutes one strategic area. And this we have to keep in mind when thinking about the Arctic and its strategic role. Uh, Sweden is one of the eight Arctic countries and with that comes a responsibility for the region. Uh, Sweden is giving growing attention to the increasing international interest and the changing geopolitical landscape in the region. And we have recently renewed our strategy for the Arctic region. Our, our long-term interest in the Arctic are of course peace and stability, protecting the unique environment and creating opportunities for all the indigenous people who live in the Arctic. Um, in all this demand a close cooperation with other Arctic nations based on and with respect for international law. Uh, and the increasing importance of the Arctic is due to two factors. The climate change, which um, opens the area for exploration of nat natural resources and shipping routes. And secondly, the Russian military buildup in the region. Russia's increasing military presence in the Arctic is parallel with its military buildup in the Baltic Sea region and elsewhere. And since 2008, both Russian civil and military investments and capabilities have increased notably in the Arctic. A special command, the North Joint Strategic Command with the Northern Fleet as the main striking force is established to bolster the command and control capacity in the region. And Russia is prioritizing the modernization and reinforcement of the Russian air defense, new surveillance radars, fighter units are added to the region. Furthermore, deployment of the S-400 air defense system, ship-borne missile systems, and the bastion coastal missile systems. And the naval bases on the Kola Peninsula are home to Russia's strategic nuclear submarines, constituting a vital component in Russian deterrence, both in words and means. It was a clear indication of the military importance Russia attaches to the region when we could observe about 10 submarines simultaneously active in the North Atlantic Ocean and in and around the Borent Sea in October 2019. And to support military operation and to prepare for future increased maritime transport, Russia is developing and constructing military infrastructure along its northern coastline. Former Soviet bases are reopened and modernized, but also new maritime support bases are established. 
the infrastructure compromises aerodromes, radar station, air control systems, and more. The opening of the Northeast Passage is of clear economic interest for Russia, as well as, as for other nations. The Arctic Ocean shipping road connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific Oceans will potentially uh, become commercially viable. Russia and other nations' uh, exploitation of gas and other national resources will pose challenges. It will likely spur Russian ambitions to add military capacities in the region. And this is a fast development. Uh, we have seen it for barely 10 years. In late 2013, the Russian Northern Fleet opened an airfield at the island Kotelny with a task to protect offshore oil and gas resources. In March 2014, paratroopers were dropped on the island to demonstrate Russians' capacity to operate in Arctic conditions. And we have seen this basically every year. And another pattern is Arctic elements in the yearly Russian strategic exercises. To sum up, numerous examples of military activities, exercises and operation in the region, and we expect this to continue. We also see an increased interest and involvement of China in the Arctic. So far, mainly focusing on economic commit, uh, activity and on science and polar research. China's presence and strategic interest in the region will have security policy implication. And the military dimension of China's actions is so far limited. Although Russian and Chinese interests in the region differ considerably, the Arctic could become an area for closer coordination and cooperation between the two. And distinguished audience, what I have described is a reality we must take seriously. We have a number of uh, cooperative forums, both on military and political levels that are active in the Arctic. The broad interest in the Arctic from several actors underlines the importance of well-functioning multilateral cooperation, where the Arctic 8 has a special role and responsibility. Sweden puts a high value in the constructive cooperation between the countries of the Arctic Council, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. Here, fruitful cooperation is ongoing on many non-security related matters, which contributes to confidence building in the region. We are keen to maintain and develop this cooperation. However, Dialogue and cooperation must be complemented with a credible defense policy and posture. One instrument to express your ability to act with other countries is military exercises. Allow me to point at some examples of exercises in the Arctic region. Uh, the Nordic states have a long history of co cooperation in Nordic defense cooperation. Uh, this applies in peacetime, but also with the ambition to be ready and able to act together in the event of a crisis or conflict. Every other year, we conduct the biannual air exercise, Arctic challenge exercise, in the northern parts of Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Together with the United States, the Nordic Air Forces have developed this to a flag level exercise with more than 100 fighters from more than 10 nations. This is something beyond a regular military exercise. It sends a clear security policy signal that the Nordic nations and the US have a shared interest in addressing security in the North Atlantic Ocean and the Arctic. Engaging in multilateral exercises is also critical in order to develop our national capabilities, as well as developing our capability to act together. The Swedish exercise Northern Wind 2019 focused on enhancing our capability to conduct combat operations at the brigade level. With sub substantial participation from Norway, Finland, the US and the United Kingdom. 
cross-border training is another example in which the Nordic countries air forces engage practically every other week of the year. Uh, Sweden also participated in the NATO exercise Trade Juncture in Norway 2018 and, part, and we take part of the um, Norwegian exercise called response. And the Nordic nations each have capable forces and the will and ability to act together. Still, US and other allies engagement in Nordic training and exercises uh, is essential to uphold a credible deterrence and defense posture in the region. The establishment of the US Navy Second Fleet and its presence during exercises in our region brings stability. In the event of a crisis, the North Atlantic and the Scandinavian Peninsula would play important roles in military support from North America to Europe. The defense bill adopted by Parliament in December last year strengthened the military presence and capability in Northern Sweden, as well as the opportunities to operate in the Arctic environment. I would also like to highlight the trilateral cooperation between Finland, Norway and Sweden launched in September 2020 with a focus on coordinated military operations in crisis and conflict. As a first step, we are taking the collaboration on the North Kalot further, the common landmass in the North. And let me end with a few words on Sweden's partnership with NATO. Uh, since 2000. 14, our cooperation with NATO has deepened with focus on political dialogue, training and exercises and information exchange. And I believe we have strong mutual interests to continue in all these areas. And we um, have the ambition to intensify security and defense policy dialogue in bilateral cooperation and multilateral security and defense policy forums. Uh, with focus on the Baltic Sea region as well as the Arctic and the North Atlantic. Further, I would like to emphasize that interoperability and common exercises are necessary for the ability to conduct effective operations. In the Total Defense Bill, uh, we signal our commitment to continue our work on joint operational planning with Finland, and we also express our interest to coordinate national operational planning with close partners and NATO. And to sum up, the North Atlantic, the Arctic and the Baltic Sea regions should be viewed as one strategic area. In response to the Russian military buildup, we are deepening security and defense policy cooperation in Northern Europe. In this, a strong transatlantic li link remains important for Sweden. Sweden is a close partner to NATO and we are committed to continue to work to keep this up as a partnership of mutual benefit. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you. Mr. Lagerlof, I uh, appreciate your presentation. appreciate you being here and, and of course, uh, your virtual hosting uh, of, of, this, uh, uh, of this presentation. I'm going to open the, the question as we're waiting for people to come in in the queue. Um, last week, um, I participated with the American Enterprise Institute um, in a discussion concerning the JEF, the Joint Expedi Expeditionary Force uh, led by the UK. Uh, Peter Holquist, uh, your, uh, your Minister for Defense, participated, and there were representatives from Estonia and, and Latvia. And a, a lot of the focus um, of the presentations uh, was how uh, the JEF, or the Joint Expeditionary Force, um, coordinates uh, with NATO. You know, as you know, within NATO, there are, are you know, uh, un, um, so many uh, bilateral, um, multilateral groups and organizations, uh, all of which, though, that uh, they come together uh, to support NATO, many of which include uh, countries like yourself that are not actual members of, of NATO. Could, could you describe how, how you see um, the, the Jeff and some of these other organizations that you were just listing um, 
how um, how they come together to help form a, a broader umbrella and broader capabilities for NATO. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and uh, I uh, actually listened to the seminar, so thank you for your participation. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and uh, this is, I think, very uh, essential in our thinking how to deal with the, the situation and the deteriorating security situation to um, um, to build this uh, different layers or a security network that would be strong enough to uh, deter from any military uh, adventures adventures from from um, um, the opponent um, and uh, we see uh, as I think was clear from this um, uh, seminar that Jeff is a group of like-minded countries we can uh, we have strong similar national interest to act together and uh, can do it I think fairly quickly and in uh, effective and, and the Jeff is also a, a, a command um, structure and uh, everything from secure systems to that you actually are able to to react and act uh, in a certain situation. And I think uh, all this is, um, and it's outspoken, it's complementary to what you do nationally and uh, between countries uh, in other bilateral and trilateral formats. And of course, also uh, reinforcing NATO and complementing NATO. So we see no contradiction in this. Um, we see that this is a group of the countries we, we usually work closely with in, in, our, in our part of Europe, but also in international operations. So this will form a, a, a solid group that maybe could react uh, very uh, fast in, in, a, in a situation and that would complement the other international organization. And it's also a way to show that we are doing our homework, that we are taking responsibility of our vicinity and, and, and develop how we, we uh, work together. And, and uh, with the UK as a framework nation, that also brings possibilities for other uh, nations in the group to join the UK uh, formations and, and uh, um, uh, frameworks uh, in different Way. So, so I think it's a very useful and we put a lot of emphasis um, as the other Jeff countries to, to make this operational. Excellent. Ethan? Well, we originally had Attila. He seems to have dropped off. But now we will then move on to Lord Campbell from the UK, followed by Alex Shelbrook. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the most interesting uh, presentation. Uh, interesting both in the conclusions to be drawn from it and indeed the information which you provided. Um, and I particularly applaud your emphasis upon interoperability, which I think is absolutely fundamental, not only to NATO, but of course with its partners as well. The question I'm going to ask may be rather sensitive, and I'll understand if you feel to some extent constrained. But I wonder if there has been any increase in the challenges to the territorial integrity of Sweden either by air or under sea from Russia? Yeah, yeah thank you for the, um, the uh, question. And of course, we have seen a lot more of activity uh, the past maybe six, seven years from the Russian side, uh, which have, I think, led to also more uh, um, uh, activity on the west side and so it's it's more activity in, in the close to our borders uh, and uh, since a few years ago we decided to to go public with any uh, um, territorial uh, whatever is, is sea or uh, or uh, air uh, space is um, uh, um, and, and um, so um, uh, we have uh, a few examples of Russian um, ships. We had a few uh, destroyers last year coming close to the, on the west coast to uh, close to the port of 
uh, Gothenburg. Uh, so this is all public information. Um, and and uh, in addition to this, we see more um, provocative and reckless behavior some times from the Russian side, uh, mostly in, in uh, terms of air. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is a bit of, it comes and goes, and uh, we have the feeling that they decide to pick on one nation or a couple of nations at a time, and then uh, choose another one to uh, to test maybe. Um, so we take good note of this and, and uh, are very uh, active and um, uh, to keep our territorial integrity. So, um, um, so I think in absolute numbers, it, it's a bit less of uh, Russian activity that is at least formally recognized as uh, intrusion on, on or airspace or, or sea uh, space. We will now move to uh, Alec Shelbrook from the UK delegation, followed by uh, Fikri Ishik from Turkey. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, good, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you for uh, your presentation. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, you spoke about interoperability and how important um, that is. Um, what I was wondering was, what role do you think Sweden needs to take in developing the PESCO outlook and the European Defence Fund? Obviously, the main tenants around that is to have a lack of replication across uh, the members of PESCO. And I was wondering, um, with um, many NATO, big NATO allies outside of that, and it's certainly being set up as a closed shop, um, what do you feel that Sweden needs to have at its disposal, which perhaps can't be um, distributed out to other nations to ensure that, that intercooperability um, can take place? So how, how do you think um, Sweden needs to be shaping um, PESCO and being involved in PESCO? Uh, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, we certainly we are part of PESCO and take um, active part in a number of projects and uh, also lead one project uh, together with uh, with uh, France in, in uh, for testing uh, and uh, evaluation. So just to give you an example that uh, what the PESCO pro projects covering a wide range of different activities with the idea of if you do it together, you can do it more um, efficient. Uh, you can perhaps save money. You can perhaps develop things or uh, train in a more efficient way. And whether this will be a big success story, I think time will tell. We are still in the um, startup phases. It's been two years. So, uh, and uh, for us as a principle it is to have this as an um, open endeavor. We don't really believe by principle that's or, or that kind of EU would like to work in that is um, free trade and open uh, uh, with other partners. And this has been uh, particularly uh, uh, active in both when it comes to PESCO and EDF um, to that this should be open for our close partners. And now we have a a start with a, a framework and we also have some um, um, non-EU uh, allies that will uh, join the uh, military mobility project which I think is a good example that you can't really separate. Um, um, it's only to look at the map again it's very difficult if you would exclude some geographical areas. Uh, so this is uh, something that is in, in our interest, also when it comes to more uh, industrial uh, cooperation, since we have um, our uh, defense industry is uh, to, to a large extent owned by, by uh, other interests, uh, but with the main activities, uh, research, production in Sweden. So uh, we have an interest also to, to let these uh, industries compete uh, on the same uh, level as uh, others um, and also see this as a European um, uh, endeavor. So, um, 
So it's a complex issue, but for us, it's uh, obvious that this should be done in an open uh, manner uh, and uh, to be more successful and to achieve more results. Thank you. We now have two speakers, one from Tur first one from Turkey, uh, Fikri Ishik, followed by Kamil Aydin. Do you hear me? Uh, good afternoon and good morning for everyone. And uh, thank you very much for a brief and fruitful uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, you talked about the co closer cooperation between China and uh, Russia in Nordic uh, Arctic region. Uh, we all know that uh, the importance of uh, the region is getting more and more important uh, in uh, world trade. We know that. And uh, my question is, uh, what uh, the result may uh, about closer co cooperation of uh, Russian, uh, Russia and China in the region? And uh, will it evolve to uh, military op coordination or military cooperation? And the uh, probable consequences of the closer cooperation for NATO and all the uh, regional allies uh, of uh, NATO. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. And th this is certainly uh, um, uh, something we try to look very carefully um, together with our fellows in the in the region and um, uh, as I said in my presentation the uh, what you can refer to as proper military activity from China's side is low in the region however uh, they are uh, very active in other areas we have also seen uh, uh, very uh, various activities in order to uh, to uh, uh, to invest in uh, infrastructure. We had a case in on the Swedish uh, West Coast and they wanted to um, build a transport hub. Of course, maybe not for uh, primarily for, uh, for uh, military use, but still a, build, uh, a power brick in, in, a, in building a, a security network that could be used for different means. So, so uh, and uh, of course we know the uh, investments in uh, uh, critical infrastructure, etc., that takes place, and we have a number of processes for screening and, and discussing this among concerned countries. Uh, whether this will be done in uh, coordination and cooperation with Russia, I think remains to be seen. Uh, we know that there are contacts between the two, of course, um, and uh, even some sort of navy talks. Um, and we have uh, a few years ago, we had uh, Chinese ships, uh, warships in, in uh, the Baltic Sea, for example, first time and, and uh, uh, participating in basic exercises uh, with the Russian counterpart. But we, we talked about interoperability earlier. I think the interoperability uh, to our, our assessment at least is low between the, the the Chinese and Russian military. So uh, I would uh, say it's maybe it's more of coordination if there is a mutual interest between the two rather than proper military cooperation. But there are other areas and uh, uh, some suggest that the division of labor in some areas would be a possibility. So I think this is a very uh, accurate issue to discuss and also uh, uh, follow up for the for the time being uh, and we also have the feeling that the two wants to they want to show that they they have an, some sort of uh, cooperation as a signal as well and then we have to look at it and see how concrete and uh, what the output will be Thank you. Thank you. Our remaining question is uh, from Kamil Aydin from Turkey. Uh, 
Good afternoon to everybody. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. Lagerlof for his very illuminating information about the, uh, the situation of the region, in particular, uh, the defense sec uh, and security situation of the Arctic region. Uh, sir, I would like to ask a question. Uh, in your brief presentation, you mainly focused on the Russian ambitions about the region, basically in military sense, whereas you confined the Chinese concerns to only economic, scientific, and polar researches. By emphasizing that, this is your sentence, Chinese military activity is far limited. So, you know, uh, it, 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 it brings a question to my mind, and I would like to direct to you, you know, that question. And is it because of your expertise limitation to Russia and the Russian activities in the region, or actually China is so irrelevant to the military, you know, uh, issues in the region? I, I really, you know, I wonder your, your answer to this question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. So it's a bit linked, I think, to the previous question. Um, but um, um, I, I think this is uh, uh, to be uh, have the military presence, um, to be the military player in this area, uh, at least from our Nordic perspective on the Arctic, is very much something that uh, Russia would like to uh, to be the first player in all this, uh, and maybe um, I would assume that they have a limited interest to see more Chinese military activity in uh, in the region. Investments, yes. Uh, cooperation in other policy areas, yes, but maybe not um, in the, in the, the sense of uh, being present. Uh, military wise but um, um, as I said something we have to follow closely and uh, see what it, this will will uh, uh, take us um, and um, uh, and if you go more into hybrid activities uh, other things I think the, the Chinese activity is already there and uh, something we have to deal with and live with but um, um, as I said, as we see it, limited um, military activity and uh, maybe not in the interest of Russia that this, this uh, uh, will uh, increase. So they, uh, we will see for the future, but that's how we see it for the time being. Mr. Langerloff, thank you so much for your presentation and for your answering the questions. It's so important for us to hear directly from you. Um, not only is the your subject matter of the Arctic um, today um, uh, incredibly important for us, uh, but also uh, hearing of uh, Sweden's uh, participation uh, and the policy issues uh, of, of Sweden are inc incredibly important to our overall dialogue. So I want to thank you personally for participating. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank you for answering uh, the, the questions of our members. Uh, thank you for having me. Our pleasures. Excellent. Uh, next, uh, we're going to turn to our next speaker, uh, John Manza. Uh, John, if you would go ahead and request the floor while I'm doing your introduction. Um, John Manza is the Assistant Secretary General for Operations at NATO. Uh, he's responsible for operations in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Iraq, and at sea, as well as exercises, plan, defense capacity building with partner nations. Most notably for today, he is coordinating the Allied withdrawal from Afghanistan, which is of great interest to all of us. Uh, we thank him for taking his time out of his very busy schedule to be part of this discussion uh, for our committee. Uh, Dr. Manza has uh, briefed this committee on previous occasions, and we're always appreciative of his information. Uh, Dr. Manza, this is obviously the uh, most important area of concern that, that people have as to how uh, we depart. Uh, we appreciate your presentation today. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll keep my presentation short uh, because usually the uh, the real meat of these presentations comes from the question and answer uh, period. Um, but just quickly to begin, you know, I think you're all aware that uh, last month NATO's foreign and defense ministers uh, made this decision to uh, 
terminate the resolute support mission and withdraw all NATO forces from Afghanistan. Um, since that decision, the withdrawal is is proceeding as as planned. It's moving moving quite fast. Um, General Miller, our commander there, has made it clear that any attacks on our forces during this period will be met with a forceful response. And in the open press, you've all seen that uh, the United States has positioned uh, forces to uh, uh, to carry out a response if if required. But in general, uh, thus far, the response has been uh, orderly, coordinated, and and very deliberate, and we expect it to be completed within uh, a few months. Uh, as the ministers stressed, withdrawing our forces does not mean the end of our relationship with Afghanistan. Uh, and to the contrary, the Secretary General has described this as a new chapter in the partnership between NATO and Afghanistan. Now, following the decision, we began work uh, immediately to define this new chapter. And I'm happy to update you uh, today that just a few days ago on the 12th of May, the North Atlantic Council approved a new concept of delivering NATO support to Afghanistan. And let me highlight some of the elements of that, uh, that concept. First of all, you know, when we looked at, um, at Kabul in particular and what the needs are of the international community in Kabul, uh, we identified right away uh, two key elements, and that is a, a functioning and safe airport in Kabul and a, um, uh, a hospital that's available for the international community. So the, the international diplomatic and development community to stay require those two, those two elements. Now, without a lot of time to attack that problem, um, allies turned very quickly to agreeing to fund uh, civilian contracts uh, to keep the airport services uh, functioning and to provide a civilian hospital at an undetermined uh, location uh, in, in Kabul. So I'm super proud of allies, frankly, for, for doing this because this is not cheap or easy, but they recognized uh, right away the importance of keeping the, the diplomatic and development community in Kabul. Um, a second piece of this is the funding of the Afghan security forces. You know, when I was working at the Pentagon first on Afghanistan many, many years ago now, we used to talk about the Russian mistake, which wasn't that the Russians withdrew from Afghanistan. The mistake was that they stopped paying the Afghan, uh, or yeah, paying for the Afghan security forces and that's what led to the collapse and, and the, uh, the rise in particular of the Taliban. So the allies have committed to uh, continuing to fund the Afghan national defense and security forces. We've also set up a substantial program of out of country education and training. Um, you know, we've had success in two areas in particular. Uh, with the Afghan forces that we always highlight. And these are the Afghan Air Force and the Afghan Special Forces. Uh, now, the United States, in a bit of a division of labor, they are going to continue training out of country uh, the Afghan Air Force. So it's pilots and, and mechanics and, uh, and providing uh, logistical support for that, that Air Force. Um, but this other leg of, of our success is the special forces and NATO allies have agreed to take this on uh, as well. So we are uh, very busy right now uh, planning um, for how we can move Afghan special forces uh, at a small unit level outside of Afghanistan to training locations uh, where we can continue uh, training those, uh, those forces. Uh, there's a host of other training, of course, that we'll do that we've been doing really over the last 15 years that will continue to officer education and opportunities for um, government officials to be trained, um, you know, in uh, in some fairly, 
you know, even mundane skills uh, that that government officials need in the in the in the ministries. Um, but but the lion's share of the the training will be this uh, this special forces uh, training. Both of those things, you know, we talk about hard won gains, and those are two hard won gains that we do not uh, we do not want to give up. Now to coordinate all of this in in Kabul. We're going to retain our office of the senior civilian representative. Uh, right now, it's Ambassador Ponte Corvo, who's done an excellent job, and he has a team there. We've decided to uh, to keep that team, to keep it at ambassadorial level, uh, and and they will help us uh, coordinate this out of theater training. They will help help us with the uh, Afghan National Army Trust Fund. Uh, well, they'll they'll work that. They will help us with these contracts for the the hospital uh, and the airfield, and they'll do other things that you would expect to uh, maintaining normal diplomatic relations with the government of Afghanistan, uh, reporting back to the council on the uh, the security and and political situation, of course, as well. Now, a few days ago, I. Um, I called Minister Atmar, the, the foreign minister of Afghanistan, to seek his uh, support to these items I've just laid out for you. And he was very enthusiastic, uh, wants us to get going uh, as soon as possible, especially on the, the special forces training. So, um, so we, are, we are running at, at top speed to put that uh, together. Um, and then last, Lee, I would just say that um, any assistance that we provide uh, to the government of Afghanistan going forward, we're going to closely coordinate with them, as, as you would expect. Uh, I'm hoping to meet Minister Atmar perhaps face to face in the uh, in the weeks ahead to begin detailing uh, that uh, that training and, and other support. So let me stop there and uh, and take take questions if I may. Great. Thank you, Dr. Manzit. I appreciate uh, the, uh, your, your dedication to what's going to be a very important issue. We just had a hearing uh, last week at the House Armed Services Committee on this very topic. And I'm going to tell you the three things that people were most concerned about and allow you to comment on them before we turn to Ethan then, who will uh, turn to uh, the questions from our, our committee members. Uh, the first <clears throat> is that um, you know, coordination is easy to say, but difficult to accomplish. Uh, there are reports uh, that there are NATO members who may uh, haphazardly uh, depart as opposed to in a coordinated fashion, which, of course, would overall affect the safety and security of those that remain. Uh, to what extent are you concerned uh, that um, NATO members <clears throat> might not follow the most um, organized uh, departure and, and how will it affect security? Uh, secondly, um, the counterterrorism mission is not going to stop. Um, and but now is going to have to be prosecuted from uh, logistics that are going to be very, very difficult, less access. We don't have proximity. We don't have uh, host nations uh, that are, are going to allow uh, facilities around Afghanistan uh, to be utilized. Um, and how do you see that uh, counterterrorism mission being coordinated as a NATO mission? Uh, we know, of course, the U.S.'s in involvement. Um, and then thirdly, and, and the last one, um, is that uh, you mentioned uh, the concern of needing airports and hospitals. But if we are going to prosecute the counterterrorism mission, that means that we are going to have to be going in and out. Um, and to what extent are, is planning underway uh, to ensure that facilities are available to the extent that um, the U.S. or its NATO partners uh, do have to return perhaps sporadically to uh, address the counterterrorism mission? Well, thanks, sir, for those uh, questions. Uh, first of all, concerning uh, uncoordinated withdrawals, um, to be totally honest, I, I have not seen it. Um, General Miller has uh, has had this plan in his back pocket for uh, for several months now. You know, the previous administration, of course, uh, uh, was driving this uh, mission in their minds down to zero. So it's planning didn't just begin a month ago. Um, and he's shared that with all the nations and, and with us at NATO headquarters. I've not seen a single nation rush to the exit. They're all lining up exactly according to the plan. Um, so I, I honestly have no concern there uh, at all. 
Now, on this issue of counterterrorism, um, you know, NATO has been for years in a, in a non-combat mission. The United States, along with a small number of, of allies, but not under a NATO banner, they have been carrying out counterterrorism missions. Um, so NATO's mission, you know, uh, has been non-combat since, uh, since uh, the beginning of, uh, of 2015. And, um, and we're, there's, there's no uh, uh, combat mission, uh, counterterrorism uh, included in this uh, upcoming uh, NATO engagement. So I, I really can't talk about those things that, that the United States might do and, and the things that they would need uh, to prosecute that. What we are doing, you know, frankly, for counterterrorism is ensuring that the hard-won gains with the Afghan commandos, of which there's, you know, uh, tens of thousands right now, is that we don't lose that capability uh, because they are the counterterrorism uh, force that, that day-to-day is, uh, is uh, working in Afghanistan. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ethan? Yes. Our first questioner is Lord Campbell from the United Kingdom, followed by Rep Dunn from Florida. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Most interesting. Um, I know we there was always going to be a day when we had to leave, uh, but I think you know that there's some apprehension generally among allies about the consequences of leaving. Uh, my first question really has been touched on by Mike Turner, uh, but just to say this, the maintenance of an airport, uh, the maintenance of a good quality hospital, these are big targets. Uh, how are we going to ensure the security of these? I mean, to put, if it doesn't seem too flippant, I mean, you can sit at the end of a runway with a very basic uh, surface air missile and cause a very considerable amount of damage and indeed, uh, indeed disruption. And the other point, one of the uh, most notable features of NATO's presence has been the gains that have been able to be made for women. Uh, in the discussions that you described to us, was any account taken of the fact uh, that these gains have always been the subject of controversy, to put it mildly, and that women have in the recent past, for example, the two judges who were killed, women have not been in the, not been completely safe, if I would put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir, for those questions. Um, yeah, security, of course, is, is a, a major concern uh, for the airport in, a, in particular, because as you described, an airport is a, a relatively easy target since it's just by their nature, they take up so much uh, uh, space, and it's difficult to uh, to defend. Um, there have not been a lot of attacks on the airport um, over the last uh, last ten years, and the Afghan uh, National Defense and Security Forces have, have done a good job of providing layered defense there. Um, at the airport itself, Turkey has had. Uh, uh, over the years, a substantial number of troops, along with uh, a few a few partner and allied nations. Um, I believe I can't speak for Turkey, but but all indications and what they've told us in the council is that Turkey will remain at the airport in a bilateral relationship with the government of of Afghanistan. So not under a NATO uh, under a NATO banner. Um, I believe that 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 would be uh, most welcome if Turkey were to do that. Um, it will bolster through morale the Afghan uh, security forces knowing that, that Turkey's there. Turkey has a, you know, a special cultural relationship uh, with the government of Afghanistan and, and the people. So, you know, inside perhaps uh, uh, several rings of security having Turkey on that uh, innermost ring uh, would be very uh, valuable in, in my mind. Um, but as in uh, a lot of places around the world, uh, you know, I'm in, in route today, I'm sorry, it's why I'm dressed the way I am in this hotel room, uh, to Baghdad, you know, it's a similar situation uh, there where we rely on the host nation uh, to provide the, the security uh, for our forces and, and in this case uh, for, for the airport. Um, you know, and for Afghanistan in particular, 
uh, and for Turkey, you know, Turkey provides this uh, vital link economically. Turkish Airlines flies in and out of there uh, seven days a week, and and we need to keep that uh, that link uh, open. But you know, nobody can predict what the security situation will be in the the months months ahead as the resolute support uh, forces uh, withdraw. But um, you know, in my talk with uh, Minister Atmar uh, and I'm sure the rest of the Afghan uh, government, they they recognize the the important economic link that that uh, that airport provides. So I, I'm sure they will uh, redouble their efforts to uh, to defend it. Um, on women's rights, you know, obviously this is a, a significant concern for for everybody. Uh, in Afghanistan uh, and, and for all the allies and partners who contributed really for everybody you know, around the world uh, who are concerned about women's uh, rights in that country. Um, you know, this is why we need to continue to support the government of Afghanistan and, and, uh, and do everything we can to ensure that their security forces are able to, to defend uh, that country and uh, provide you know, the rule of law and uh, respect for minority rights that uh, that that government still stands for. Um, so, you know, but there's no easy solution here. This is going to be going to be difficult and a, and a hard and a hard fight. Um, and I don't believe that, you know, right now, from everything I've seen uh, from the Taliban, that that we could expect them to guarantee women's rights, but uh, hopefully in either a negotiated settlement or by simply defending the country against the Taliban, that's the best way right now to protect women's rights in Afghanistan. Thank you. Our next speaker is Representative Neil Dunn from Florida. Uh, so, uh, first, Secretary Monza, let me say thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I share with Chairman Turner and, and Lord Campbell some apprehensions as we leave, and I agree, you know, there's always was a time we had to leave. Uh, uh, my apprehension is born from my experience with the Vietnam conflict, which was my era, and, and the special niche is the, the Afghan nationals who were cooperating with uh, all of the allied forces scattered throughout the country and, and the special risks that they may face as, uh, as the allies leave. And what, and uh, in Congress, I have a number of colleagues, uh, mostly veterans, uh, and we're concerned for them. We're trying to raise the levels of, of immigration for them specifically on an emergency basis. Uh, but what can NATO do about that? And, and how does the, how do the NATO allies fit, fit into that, you know, protecting that particular group? Well, sir, uh, thanks for the question. You know, my, uh, I gotta tell you, um, my oldest brother fought uh, twice in, in Vietnam. So thank you for your, your service there. Um, this issue of, uh, of protecting uh, or providing uh, immigration opportunities for Afghans who, who've helped us, uh, these are national is issues. So the United States, uh, in, you know, in, uh, in particular, uh, through your work, um, that, that's a, it's a national issue. So uh, really just to cut to the chase and give you a short answer, NATO um, as a, we're not a, a state, and and we don't have uh, any ability to uh, uh, to do that. We we leave this up to the nations. It's certainly discussed in the council, um, and uh, individual uh, permanent representatives they can implore other allies to ensure that we protect uh, these folks who've who've helped us out. But in the end, it's it's only a national national issue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Oyars Collins from Latvia. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your presentation. How much do we know about outside support for Taliban, whether it's military, economic, or, or political? Uh, you mentioned Russia earlier, uh, and, and we all know about uh, the bounties that apparently Russia was paying to some of the Afghans. Are we aware of any either Russian or other country involvement 
that may try to fill in the gap once the NATO forces leave to support the Taliban. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, this is a, a very difficult one to discuss on an unclassified uh, open uh, network like this. Um, frankly, I, I, I'm not comfortable talking about that in, in, in this form. Honest answer. And that's for the last question I have. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we wish you well on your, your trip to Baghdad. Uh, thank you for participating. Thank you for uh, the difficulty of your, your job and, the, the, and your dedication to it. Uh, it really does help all of us to have an opportunity to speak to you and to for you to answer our questions. Um, if along the way um, th there are issues that uh, you know we need to be aware of, please stay in touch uh, with the NATO PA because they have an ability to communicate with all of our members. And we'd greatly like to, to hear um, about uh, your successes and, and what's happening in the future. So, Dr. Menza, thank you for uh, participating. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and, and best of luck to you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're now going to turn to our, um, our reports. Um, if uh, Cedric Perrin would uh, begin to uh, request the floor. Um, the, um, we're going to examine our committee's draft report on arms control uh, by our general rapporteur, uh, Cedric Perrin from uh, France. Uh, the report gives us a great uh, detail of the history of arms control, um, the goals and objectives that it helps us achieve, and uh, and, and I, um, a hopeful caution que vous uh, as we go forward. Thank you for being here, Cedric. The floor is yours. Good afternoon or good morning, Mike. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, first and foremost, I'd like to say that it really is a pleasure uh, to uh, be back with all of you, even though, unfortunately, as was the case last year, uh, we're on this, uh, in this virtual setting once again. I hope we can meet again face to face in uh, fall. Today, as you have just said, I have the pleasure to present to you the first draft of the committee's general report on the future of international arms control. Last year, uh, this topic was uh, chosen, and uh, clearly the worldwide global arms control architecture was under serious pressure. So looking into the topic since January, I realized that uh, this was an urgent question that had to be addressed. At the time, the US and Russia hadn't yet extended the New START agreement, and it wasn't clear whether or not they would do so before its expiration date on the 5th of February. The treaty was rescued in the end, but only just. If it had expired, it would have led to the collapse of yet another arms control agreement in recent history, just after the demise of the INF Treaty in August 2019. The challenged renewal of New START was yet another clear signal of the significant headwinds facing uh, these types of agreements that have created in that have made it possible in the past to create predictability, transparency, and at some level of military stability. All of this, of course, is essential to guarantee uh, peace and prosperity for the Euro-Atlantic community, especially after the Cold War. Now, as the report makes clear, the past two decades, unfortunately, have witnessed the clear divergence in global great powers perceptions of the international security environment. So the Euro-Atlantic community is now faced with Russia's refusal to live up to its commitments, whether it's maintaining the limitations of the INF, adhering to the Vienna document, or the open skies and conventional forces in Europe treaty. New Starty is for now the only remaining agreement limiting the size of the world's two largest strategic nuclear arsenals, arsenals, and as such, it is a key instrument to prevent a potential renewal of our, an, uh, another nuclear arms race, uh, such as the one we witnessed during the Cold War. The treaty is also a clear manifestation of the historical arms control processes uh, described in the report. Uh, the New START agreement is the most recent agreement built on a string of previous agreements negotiated, the one after the upper at the beginning of the 70s. New START was signed in 2011, but it was built directly on the SORT agreement, 2002, which was 
uh, directly built on the 93 start agreement, which in turn was built on the SALT agreements of the, of the 70s. So the end of the new start agreement would have meant a breaking point in a decades long historical process. The US and Russia both recognize the need to save the process by extending new start for another five years. As the report makes clear, however, um, the arms control process is ailing and that is not something new. If allies really want to support an arms control framework that makes a key contribution to achieving allied security objectives and that works to ensure strategic stability and collective security, then the process as a whole has to take into account the rapidly changing and increasingly complex international security environment. Adapting the arms control architecture to meet today's challenges, of course, will not be easy. This draft report highlights what I believe are the most uh, salient and pressing issues. The first challenge, limiting the expansion of existing nuclear arsenals uh, by non-allied powers. As we uh, saw with the end of the INF Treaty, Russia has um, really been developing new destabilizing nuclear delivery systems uh, that seek to undermine Euro-Atlantic peace and security. As Russia's arsenal diversifies, it will be increasingly difficult to incorporate its wide variety of weapons under comprehensive limits, limits, and this will make it easier for Russia to circumvent future treaties. Russia also remains intransigent in its refusal to engage in any negotiations related to its non-strategic nuclear weapons. China's posture even more concerning. Experts, many experts agree that uh, uh, Beijing is undertaking the most aggressive expansion of its nuclear arsenal in history. Um, and some estimates uh, say that China will double its nuclear arsenal in the next decades. And this is especially concerning uh, given that China is refusing to engage in any serious dialogue about nuclear forces. Second challenge, horizontal proliferation, i.e. the spread of nuclear weapons to non-nuclear states. The logic is quite simple. Uh, the more uh, countries possess nuclear weapons, the more difficult it will be to bring them all together uh, to uh, sign binding agreements to limit or restrain their nuclear arsenals. As we speak, Iran is still refusing to abandon its illegal nuclear program, and if Tehran were to acquire a nuclear weapon, this could provoke its neighbors to pursue their own nuclear capabilities, potentially setting off a cascade of regional proliferation throughout the greater Middle East. The threat of regional uh, cascading is especially concerning in Asia, where multiple countries possess both the means to produce a nuclear weapons and reasons to do so. You have, nu you have China, North Korea, for example, becoming uh, increasingly aggressive. Then you have the uncertain impact of emerging and disruptive technologies. Simply put, it will be difficult to convince governments that cannot predict how future technologies will affect their military capabilities tomorrow to uh, start limiting those uh, capabilities today. You have powerful new technologies, AI, offensive cyber capabilities, and cyber weaponry. They have the potential to revolutionize the overall conduct of warfare, warfare in ways we cannot even imag imagine. It is true these technologies may actually make arms control more effective in the future. We cannot guarantee that for the time being. Now, I've <laughs> all given us a good scare. Um, I, I'd want to move on now to the positive solutions and act actions available to us, because yes, I think there are solutions to these problems. I've raised a number of them in my report, and I will highlight uh, the few solutions that I think are particularly relevant here. First, I think we should start with what is more relevant for this audience. As legislators, we have a unique role to play in ensuring that arms control plays a key role in allied security debates. As public representatives, our constituents and governments, we can raise awareness about the arms control uh, mechanisms. We can encourage relevant parties to launch negotiations on new agreements, and we can even encourage renewed interest in arms control uh, amongst younger generations. Parliaments have a critical role in the development of national arms control policy, of course. 
in treaty negotiations and also in ratification and implementation of agreements. Parliaments also play a role in enacting and maintaining a national legal framework reflecting our government's international arms control commitments, uh, specifically overseeing such critical issues as export controls and sanctions regimes. To tackle the most challenging issues facing arms control today and in the future, the report advocates a stronger role for the Alliance as a consultative forum for allowing allies to better understand uh, policies and to really come up with policies. As the report notes, while NATO member states agree to and respect treaties individually, the NATO Alliance as a whole serves as an invaluable clearinghouse for information sharing and provides a 30 nation platform to amplify consensus on critical issues relating, related to arms control. Now to this end, NATO allies can work together to develop clear policies regarding uh, Russia and China's nuclear arsenals. With Russia, we need to discuss uh, ways to bring Moscow back into constructive discussions, even though relations with Moscow are at their lowest point since the Cold War. With China, we should develop a coherent whole of alliance approach to its evolving nuclear posture, uh, whilst trying to convince Chine Chinese leaders that participation in the arms control process is in their best interests. As I point out in my recommendations, I really think that one of the best ways to involve China in a multilateral arms control process is to invite its leaders and experts to discuss how emerging and disruptive technologies will be implemented in military systems in the coming decades. Given that China is emerging as a technological power, I really believe they will have a stake in jointly establishing with NATO allies a set of rules and standards on how technologies like AI, cyber and space weapons will be used in the coming decades. If um, success can be achieved in limited exploratory debates, it might pave the way for more meaningful discussions on mutual limitations and reductions of military capabilities in the future. Now I'll stop here, but thank you very much for uh, listening to these uh, thoughts. And before I conclude, I would like to once again sincerely thank uh, Ethan Corbin, as I always do. Thank you for the great work he has done and uh, my uh, as Senate Administrator. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Cedric, thank you for the great presentation and for the great work on, on this uh, report, which is an incredibly important one. Um, I, I want to just note two paragraphs um, that I think are important and then ask, ask your, your thoughts. On, on paragraph 23, thank you for the very clear statement uh, that Russia's actions of violations have sort of fractured the framework um, of um, uh, uh, coming together for these agreements. Um, and um, I also, in paragraph 27, you reflected that new start uh, gave us at least some hope because it gave us a reprieve from the number of uh, agreements that were being voided as a result of, of Russia's violations. It seems to me that it, when, if you look historically, uh, our ability to bring Russia to the table has been a result of having um, leaped ahead. In other words, we've had some military um, uh, advantage by which Russia felt that if they pulled um, the United States into an arms control agreement, um, that uh, it could limit uh, their risk. Today, we're seeing uh, Russia investing in a number of uh, very advanced nuclear weapon systems that we've never, the likes we've never seen before. Poseidon, uh, the underwater unmanned um, uh, missile, uh, Skyfall, the uh, nuclear powered missile that is supposed to orbit the earth and then uh, find its target. And of course, Russia having fielded already uh, hypersonics. It, it sort of leaves us in a, a um, unfortunate position because in order to avoid an, an, an arms race, uh, we've sought arms control but at the same time, with Russia leaping ahead, it would be the first time that we're asking them to restrain their advances instead of respond to our advances. Um, do, do you see a need for increased investment um, in, in order to be able to have those bargaining chips, those advances uh, that we can then bring Russia back to the table? Uh, because obviously, as you mentioned, um, you know, with China doubling its nuclear weapons, with Russia fielding much more complex systems, uh, you know, the next 10, 20 years are going to be very, very uh, concerning and certainly leave us all uh, less safe. Uh, Cedric, your thoughts?
Can you hear me? I think these are topics that we will have to tackle. Yes. Clear, clearly, we want to constrain Russia, but the ways in which this can be done has strongly evolved. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Please uh, continue. Yes, yeah, so I was saying the ways in which the Allies have managed to um, have Russia involved in different agreements over the past decades was limited because a lot of investments on the American side had forced Russia to um, respect or to make a certain number of decisions. This now has changed. As far as investments go, unfortunately, the coming decades will see colossal investments. It's something we observe in China. Uh, the Chinese Marine Forces, for example, have been uh, developed very strongly. So I think we need to be as optimistic as we can. I think we can, yes, have some sort of dialogue with Russia, but with Ethan, I suppose we have to work on these topics for the autumn, on the fall report, and we have to make progress on these questions because the paradigm has changed. We're no longer talking about financial restraints, even though last year we presented a report on uh, Russia's um, arms uh, policies, and we said that there was a difference between the announced budget and the real budget, there was a real gap on Russia's side. And of course, in Russia, you also have uh, education. I think we're talking about a budget of 200 billion. The, the real investments were anyway uh, very far removed from what had been announced. So investments, yes, will be part of the, of the future. And I think we're all aware of the fact that the current situation makes it difficult to make investments on our side. So it's something we'll get back to, I think, during the uh, fall report. Our, our next questioners. Yes, thank you. Our first is uh, Mr. Asgarov from Azerbaijan. It will be followed by Munir Saturi, who is from the European Parliament. Muted or microphone is not working. No. No. Perhaps you should um, refresh your screen and come back and I can pull you up for a question, sir. We cannot hear you. Yeah, moving on to the next question. Uh, Munir Satouri. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Senator Behan, dear colleagues. First, a couple of positive notes in this report I'd like to get back to. Yes, the, par the alliances MPs have to be vigilant and have to limit an arms race, which is uh, on the increase. I also share your preoccupations as far as arms control uh, goes, and I agree that it is urgent to act in the five next years. The next five years will be decisive for the future and for peace. I also fully agree to say that NATO has a key role to play in arms control. That being said, only talking about uh, the nuclear states outside of the alliance, Russia and China as uh, part of their problem is uh, not really uh, said in good faith. Vertical proliferation is also observed within the alliance. The UK has decided to announce an increase of its arsenal and um, refusal of various uh, transparency measure contributes to this arms race. And the UN Secretary General says that vertical proliferation isn't just seen elsewhere. It's something that we see in France as well. It's a shame that this report doesn't say that the tactical American weapons placed in European countries don't have any strategic function 
and are therefore superfluous and dangerous. This is what environmentalists think in Europe, but not only them, it's also the analysis of Hubert Verdrin, an ex-French foreign minister. As far as the uh, ban treaty goes, it is unacceptable that this report published by an assembly which is called representative only echoes uh, the position of what was declared in the fall last year. Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands had contributed to the 2014 humanitarian conference which drafted the ban treaty. In Belgium, the government has committed to using this treaty as best as possible, and this will probably be the case from September in Germany. The Italians have voted in their parliament to do the same, and the European Parliament and the la latest German annual report have recognized the benefits of the Ban Treaty. The uh, Spanish uh, parliament, ha parliament in 2018 had committed to signing this as well. With your report, uh, is uh, sterile on this matter and decredibil decredibilizes the position of the Allies on this uh, point. Clearly, it is not productive and it doesn't represent the opinions within the Alliance on this topic. Last but not least, we have to stop pretending that the Ban Treaty uh, goes against the NPT. Uh, researchers in the Bundestag, for example, have said it would the one would strengthen the other. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. But I'm not sure that China and Russia are going towards disarmament, if it's what you are trying to state. So in what you said, I believe there were no questions. Uh, it was mostly observations, therefore I have no answer to give to that. Ethan, before we go to our next one, I mean, obviously, um, <coughs> NATO has repeatedly taken up the issue of whether or not uh, our alliance will have a nuclear function. And uh, certainly one thing that's very important in Cedric's report is understanding of the increasing threat and investment both by Russia uh, and China. Um, in um, in their nuclear programs, which are a threat to uh, NATO and, and all of, of our members, including those countries that are aligned with us. And I also think it's important that Cedric had indicated um, that um, Russia has refused to have tactical uh, nuclear weapons be part of any um, arms control agreement, which of course, of which there are thousands uh, pointed directly at Europe. Uh, it would be great uh, if we could, as a body, um, both either debate or legislate uh, Russia's or China's choices, uh, but but we cannot. Um, and the the weapons that um, members of the alliance, including the UK, France, and the United States, uh, have within Europe, uh, are part of both bilateral and multilateral agreements to ensure uh, that we have at least a credible deterrent uh, to those thousands of of tactical nuclear weapons that Russia has pointed at. Uh, our, our European allies. Uh, Ethan? Thank you. Um, the next question Ethan? is from... Oui. Ethan. Oui. Oui. Bien sûr. Je... Uh, on... Ethan, if I may. As long as you can hear me, if you can't see me, never mind. I would like to pick up on what uh, Mike Turner said. So, the vertical proliferation by allies is uh, a necessity if we want to have a credible deterrence. And in France, we say we can live in a rosy world, of course, but China and Russia have no intention of uh, taking their weapons down. And we are all confronted to this uh, environment and of course you would love for China and Russia to not have these weapons and for everyone to love each other but this is not the world we have to be realistic every day when we read the paper we see that we do not live in this ideal world even though some of us would like uh, for us to live in this ideal world were you, th were you finished was Okay. 
Non, c'est bon, j'ai terminé. Yes, I had finished. Thank you. Mm. Our next speaker will be uh, Mariana Bejula from the Ukraine. Thank you very much. Do you hear? Do you see me? I hope that uh, the connection is okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's uh, wonderful that we have this event despite uh, all this uh, lockdown features. But uh, because of uh, um, pandemic situation, uh, Russia is in interesting in the in the activities also. Uh, I just want to sorry for my, for my English. It's I'm not a native speaker, but want, wanted to uh, to make some accents, uh, taking into account the report. Also taking into the, into account uh, the report, you said that uh, uh, Moscow continued to be unsettled by its post Cold War and role in Euro Atlantic security. And there are se uh, several uh, recommendations to continue and to communicate uh, in this way to uh, return uh, and to help the attempts uh, to return um, Russian Federation into the dialogue and uh, to increase the safety uh, uh, and, and the, uh, actually the security environment. But, um, but what we have now, uh, we have uh, not only the nuclear uh, weapon uh, enforcement. I want to make the accent that uh, so-called CIRCON, uh, which is Calm jet powered anti-ship hypersonic cruise missile, uh, is uh, currently actively and, and successfully tested by uh, Russian Federation. And actually, it's a very perspective uh, weapon in the uh, further development and it, it can uh, be uh, can attack the biggest ships uh, which is about to uh, hold the, um, uh, the plants. Uh, the second moment uh, is uh, Iskander. Iskander is just okay it's rather simple weapon it's short range ballistic missile but uh, now when uh, we had the risk of escalation this spring uh, such um, variants, uh, such as Condors, uh, missile troops uh, uh, was transferred to, uh, to the Ukrainian borders. Uh, this is the third moment we are going even lower, which is Grad. Just, okay, it's, it's very simple weapon. Uh, Grad, it's like truck mounted uh, 122 millimeter multiplier rocket launcher, but what we have, uh, what we see now, it is used in, uh, by Palestinians. It is used again Israel, just in very fresh and very uh, dangerous escalation what we have in Israel. And it is uh, the model as far as I can say is used like a Grad P. What is Grad P? It's a, a Russian weapon, which is a, a called like a partisan. Partisan, it's a, um, a, a guerrilla, is it uh, right in English, uh, which uh, can be uh, uh, used not on the, um, uh, on, on the track, but uh, uh, which is very mobile, rather cheap, and uh, which is uh, to uh, make the exhaustion of, uh, to, to make the exhausted, the um, anti-aircraft defenses Israel. So it's uh, several um, examples that according to the overall policy and strategy, strategy from Russian Federation and the potential uh, just like um, uh, direct and not direct activities in the world uh, they are about uh, a realization the aggressive policy and they are not going to uh, change it and uh, I want also to mention uh, some additional puzzles of the overall picture it's about Belarusian and according to the policy from Russian Federation they are uh, going to um, to join the uh, Belarusian state as it is. 
and it it is uh, uh, it's uh, the plans is about 2023 2024 and it's it's actually it's now and we see uh, the political and uh, um, security tendencies and actions which are about this uh, so uh, what is happening in ukraine uh, uh, we had the uh, great risk of escalation uh, in March, and uh, I will uh, mention that and uh, that according to uh, to our data, there were about uh, 100 more than 100 uh, thousand troops uh, from Russian Federation. You know this. Uh, I am sure that uh, uh, you have the information and. Uh, it was uh, transmitted um, broadly, uh, but there is a question: What is now? Uh, there were there were several um, declarations from uh, Russia that they uh, called back troops, uh, that there were only training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, just now, according to our data, there are not uh, the amount of the troops uh, um, was made. Uh, uh, smaller only uh, for 4,500 4, uh, um, uh, military. So just ma just imagine it only uh, 4 thousand and half military comparing to those uh, that uh, left. Uh, so they just made several rotations. And uh, now the amount of the troops uh, is uh, the same, and the risk is actually also the same if we are speaking about military potential. And uh, uh, there are uh, there are very interesting moments about the overall um, uh, about the overall arms control, uh, but uh, the uh, Ukraine as the target and. Uh, those what I mentioned, it's on also for the whole Europe, because uh, according to um, our information, there are even the risk, it's just, of course, not the primary scenario, but we have permanent risk uh, to uh, be attacked uh, from the Russian uh, territory, just uh, um, uh, speaking about our critical infrastructure, is atomic stations, and it's a, a, a so-called Dnipro dam. So uh, if uh, it would such uh, action would happen, uh, it's quite um, uh, understandable that it is uh, it would be catastrophe for the whole Europe. So I will uh, not be. Uh, Mariana, uh, um, I'm, we, I'm finishing. No, no, I'm I'm finishing. Okay. I was just yes, say, um, members are very, very concerned and they're very, very interested. Uh, but I, but I do need you to can conclude. So we do greatly appreciate what you're telling us because it's still it's very important and of grave concern to our members. But if you could conclude, I would appreciate it. Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, that's why I wanted to make some puzzles, uh, not to uh, make the uh, comment uh, broadly with the uh, constructed picture. Uh, it's just to mention, and uh, um, if you have additional questions, uh, I can yeah. answer. And uh, thank you for the report. Just uh, um, accent that uh, uh, it should be a little bit more proactive. Thank you. And uh, what? Merci beaucoup, Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mariana. Well, my report is not uh, finalized yet. I appreciate that the uh, Ukrainian situation is terrible and the alliance, of course, condemns the role of Russia in Ukraine. It was very interesting to hear you, of course. And thank you for having mentioned a number of weapons that are being uh, developed and used by Russia. Ethan, are there any other questions? Yes, there are two questions left. Alex Shelbrook. Hi. 
Um, 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 thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Perrin. Um, the, the report is um, um, very in depth and um, one we've been developing, and, and we get to the final point. I'll, I'll keep this very brief because um, I wasn't going to really say anything, but I just think it's important to emphasise um, I push back very strongly against the criticism of the Strategic Defence Review in Britain um, to not cut its nuclear stockpile because I think what mustn't be overlooked um, in terms of um, the UK's nuclear capability is that continuous at sea deterrent and it, it, I think a lot of us um, especially in the UK would consider that to be the ultimate deterrent that um, without the ability to not only know where that weapon system is located but when that weapon system would have to be deployed probably acts as the ultimate deterrent because you simply um, cannot possibly strategically calculate um, a safe route in, in nuclear warfare if you have no idea where retaliation may come from so I think when we um, look at the activities of Russia um, in um, in recent years, I think it's absolutely vital that, um, as, as regrettable as it is, and none of us want to um, see nuclear proliferation, but it is a um, it is a cause to solve a situation to hopefully carry on keeping the peace. And let's be honest, um, it is the most successful weapon system ever created because it has done exactly what it's supposed to do and acted as a deterrent rather than a weapon. Thank you very much. I think it was also an observation, so I will not say more on that. Thank you. Mr. Azarov, uh, Azgarov, excuse me, from Azer Azerbaijan. We'll try to bring him back up. Still, still having volume troubles, sir. Unfortunately. Try again. Nope. Can't hear you. If you are on the platform, if you go to settings in the bottom, there's a cog wheel. And then you, on that, you may be able to see the media settings tab to the top. And right there, you might be able to activate your microphone correctly. Try one, one moment here. Test, sir. If you write your mess, your question in the text box, we might, we might also be able to address it that way. Otherwise, um, Mr. Turner. Ethan, that's an excellent idea. Um, if, if there are additional questions that people can ask, please put them in the text box. Uh, Cedric, uh, I'll ask if you have any closing comments. You've been an excellent presentation and an excellent report. No, that's it on my side. I really hope that we'll be able to meet face to face uh, soon in order to completely finalize this report in autumn. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, and for all of the questioners. Uh, Jean Charles Alessonor, uh, if you would uh, begin to uh, request the floor as I do your introduction, uh, our next consideration will be of the preliminary draft report of the subcommittee on transatlantic defense and security cooperations. The report's title is security challenges in the high north. Uh, John Charles, I see you have joined us. Um, we uh, appreciate your work on this report and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, President Turner. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you to all of the Secretariat of uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly. It's a pleasure to see you uh, today, and I want to warmly thank you for taking part in this meeting today. It's a pleasure for me to present this report on the Arctic, on the High North, for two reasons. First, I'm an Arctic veteran. I lived for two years in Greenland. And also, I'm speaking from the city of Brest, not Brest in Bielorussia, but Brest in Brittany. It's the main port overlooking the Atlantic for the French fleet. And this town is also a hub of polar research with the French Polar Research Institute. Dear colleagues, 
as you may have read in this preliminary draft report, our take today is uh, a region that is uh, profoundly transforming itself. The acceleration of climate change is uh, warming up this area three times faster than the global average. And this uh, high rise in temperatures is also seen via rapid ice melt, which is disrupting the flow of air and sea currents with a major impact on the regional ecosystem and its geography. This is speeding up the change in the high north. And uh, this is what I describe in the report as the Arctic of the 21st century. The transformation of the Arctic is opening up new uh, access um, points and uh, that are open for longer durations and in increasingly higher latitudes. The melting of the ice is opening uh, new routes. The northern maritime route uh, alongside Russia can already be used almost year long. Another advantage is that the transformation of the region is giving new access to resources like gas, oil, precious ore, but also new fish resources because uh, um, uh, fish tend to migrate higher north in search of colder waters. Tourism is also exploding in the area, not during the COVID period, but of course uh, uh, it raises uh, in normal times um, questions about maritime safety and fragile ecosystems. Now, the new potential of the Arctic of the 21st century is leading to a new attention, new investment on the part of Arctic states, but also on the part of non-Arctic states. And I'm thinking here about China. Russia is also a key stakeholder in the area with more than 50% of its uh, coastal areas that border uh, the Arctic Ocean. And in the eyes of Moscow, the Arctic is a guarantee for future development opportunities. And amongst other things, also a way to position itself in the global economy. The region now represents 10 to 20 percent of Russia's GDP, depending on the mode of calculation, and about 20 to 25 percent of its total exports based on the different modes of calculation. I'm thinking gas exports mainly. China is also keeping a very close eye on the area. In 2018, you might recall that China had declared itself a, a near Arctic country despite the geographic distance that separates China from its um, northernmost border. In the new Silk Route initiative, Beijing said it would be very interested in new economic routes in the Arctic area. China has committed itself to investing more in the area, in developing its northern maritime route in Russia, uh, but also in playing a part in many scientific research and economic projects. Now, next to the economic growth in the region that is supported by China, military investment in the area is also there to protect China's new interests. The latest military investments of Russia have been even more substantial, Russia being more exposed on its northern shores. Uh, against the background of its Arctic strategy by 2035, Russia underlines the need to guarantee its sovereignty and territorial integrity in the northernmost border. The northern fleet of Russia is being significantly modernized through the acquisition, for instance, of submarines. And this demonstrates a real willingness on the part of Russia to becoming a modern naval uh, power and we'll, can come back to the elements of that modernization. Now, in order to defend its growing um, interest in the Arctic and to modernize its naval defense, Russia is also part of um, a process to update its military infrastructure with other stakeholders. About 50 uh, old outposts of the Soviet era have been either reopened and or modernized over the last few years. And since 2012, Russia uh, says that it has built 475, 475 new military facilities uh, in Russia from the Sea of Barents to the uh, Strait of Bering. Um, 
A few months ago, Russia announced its intention to build more military bases in its northernmost Arctic border with a growing, of course, concerned by the growing presence of allies along the borders of Russia. Uh, and of course, it means that Russia is investing on infrastructures that are bordering the European part of the Arctic. The size and um, muscle flexing nature of the Russian army's exercises uh, have evolved since 2014. As the preliminary draft report says, we've, we've seen a, a re-increase of the military activity of Russian forces in the area, accompanied by a, a, a policy, a very dangerous policy um, that is worrisome for the Allies. The military activity of China in the area remains limited, as our Swedish colleague mentioned earlier. But China is nevertheless trying to uh, increase its scientific research and economic footprint on the Arctic. Its investment could be worrisome because they could be a prelude to a military presence in the future. The Chinese Navy is already participating in joint exercises with Russia in the area. And the growing gap between allies and Russia in the Arctic uh, runs the risk of, change, uh, of turning the region into a place of rivalry between the great powers. And the Arctic could um, move from being a region recognized for its Pacific cooperation towards an area of increased tension. Now, despite the fact that the region played a, a major strategic role during the Cold War, it had entered into a, a phase of Pacific cooperation with the Arctic Council, and the, the Arctic Council has played a very important part to this enhanced cooperation in many areas, including um, environmental protection, without, of course, talking about matters of security that were not dealt with by the Arctic Council. But today, given the new challenges of the area, the Arctic could become something completely new than an area of cooperation. As the preliminary draft report underlines that NATO has always played a very important role in the high north. Allies have always maintained a presence in the high north, have always sought to understand the developments of the Arctic area, um, its potential vulnerabilities in uh, uh, the Greenland's, uh, Greenland, Iceland, UK um, route that allows to, that might uh, give the opportunity of moving towards Europe and uh, of course lead to the transatlantic uh, routes. And given the intensifying of presence of Russia and its traditional rivals, allies have uh, uh, taken a number of measures to defend their current future potential interests in the high north. As was the case in the past, the Arctic allies of NATO and their partners in the area, uh, US, Canada, and the European Arctic allies are showing the way, are leading the way, even if now all NATO members give the greatest attention to the means required there to defend their common interest. One of the common concerns uh, is the maintaining of freedom of navigation in that uh, Arctic area, given the fact that the Arctic maritime routes will in the future um, increase in strategic importance. Now, in addition to reinvesting in infrastructure and military capabilities to keep the clearest possible vision of the region, but also to maintain a presence in the region, um, the NATO allies in the Arctic are also concluding political agreements for enhanced cooperation, information sharing, joint exercises, and military bases. New investment of allies in the Arctic are not limited to uh, Arctic nations solely. UK and France are investing uh, in new military capabilities there to have a better operational capability in the high north and a, a wide range of allies, Germany, Poland, Estonia, for instance, are also investing both militarily and politically to be able to play a role in the Arctic of the future. Now, despite growing attention from allies in the area, NATO does not have a full consensus on what kind of role it should have, if it does need to have a role in the high north. 
the revision, uh, the upcoming revision of the strategic concept of NATO gives the Allies an opportunity to better define what the approach of NATO should be towards the region as the region is evolving rapidly. If Allies are capable of rising to that opportunity and occasion, obviously uh, NATO Allies that are Arctic nations should be at the vanguard of that process and give a unified vision of what the Arctic of the 21st century should be or is. Um, and even if there is no strategy or Arctic policy for NATO, well, the, al the Allies and NATO will be confronted with growing challenges in that particular part of the world. Um, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly has made several recommendations over the last few years, encouraging, amongst other things, the creation of a working group on the Arctic. The region has also been um, dealt with. Uh, in uh, the NATO 2030 um, process. Um, it calls for better knowledge, uh, better situational awareness, and our preliminary draft report uh, makes three main recommendations to actually put these proposals into practice. First of all, um, an increased and continuous investment in new means of ISR, intelligence, surveillance rec uh, reconnaissance. Uh, uh, these investments should allow for a better understanding of the, the regional development and have a watch system or play the role of watchdog to be abreast of the situation and its developments. Secondly, allies must have enough capabilities to be able to project power over the high north. It is a very important aspect of the Allies' defense and the defense of the, the Allies' interest in the region. They should invest more in equipment that are made to resist the difficult weather conditions in the area and train their soldiers to be able to operate in these harsh weather conditions. And finally, the Alliance should make sure that it maintains a flexible and clever, shrewd presence in the area that will be able to adapt uh, to adapt to fluctuating security situations. We see a, an increase in congested communication routes there, and at the speed of the evolution of the climate and geography of the Arctic, it calls for a well-calibrated, agile, and clear-sighted presence. Of course, that presence should be led by the Arctic allies of NATO, but it should also be based on uh, their unique understanding, the unique understanding by Arctic allies um, to make sure that it plays a role in terms of uh, uh, situational awareness. Now, in order to conclude this short briefing, it seems important to deal with the consequences of climate change. It's not the topic of the report itself, but the speeding up of climate change uh, brings about security risks, new security risks, and this will have consequences not just in the Arctic, but also in areas that are more distant from the Arctic. So the Arctic, if you want, is a bit of a precursor. And the changes that we are seeing in the Arctic could also be a sign of same the same changes happening elsewhere than the, in the Arctic area. Now, thank you very much for your attention. Of course, I'm expecting your comments or questions. And again, it is a preliminary draft report. So I will be listening to all your proposals and suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John Charles. Um, <clears throat> we appreciate your, your report and your comments. <coughs> Excuse me. In your in paragraph eighty one, uh, you referenced it in, in your your talk. You talk about the need for ISR. Um, you you have a, an interesting anecdotal statement in there of that. You know the U.S. Coast Guard stumbling uh, uh, upon a Chinese Russian uh, joint military exercise in the region that we would not have known necessarily uh, about otherwise. Um, <coughs> the um, with the uh, economic opportunities that you underscored. It's going to be incredibly important, obviously, that we that the alliance work to be able to maintain uh, access uh, of all of our, our allies uh, to the area. Um, but I'm also concerned about the issue of the Arctic being utilized to um, uh, for uh, potential surprise attacks on our allies or to, to close uh, other areas. Uh, we saw recently the Russians um, uh, had uh, three 
uh, nuclear submarines that came up through the ice uh, and had a you know, very provocative exercise. Um, the um, as you were looking at this, I would, would I, I'm assuming that that um, uh, many are surprised at at how little that we do know and see in the area. So your call for ISR investment is, is certainly important. Uh, were you surprised as you were looking at this to to the extent of which we don't have a great fidelity as to what's happening? Oui, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. President. Indeed, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you, I, I totally agree with your comments. Now, the reading that we can have amongst allies of that particular situation is that the Russian presence in the area that is increasing and, and the Russian vision of the Arctic is mainly based on the economic and commercial potential of the Arctic. We spoke about uh, the 20 to 25 percent of Russian GDP that is based in the Arctic, with gas being its main asset there. We have seen this winter, I believe, for the first time, um, a gas uh, tanker from China taking the northern route and in 11 days going from China to Rotterdam with the help of the Russians. And I believe that the Russian vision is mainly economic in essence, but it needs to be based on modernized military potential as well. You quoted the Russian military exercise, the UMKA uh, 21 uh, Russian military, military exercise that happened, as you said, uh, in the um, uh, uh, land of Alexandra, if I'm not mistaken, in the northern archipelago there, um, that military exercise backed, by the way, by um, the Russian Oceanog Oceanographic Society and uh, under Admiral Nikolai Yasmanov, which is the chief of the Russian Navy, was really a, an example of muscle flexing by the Russians. You mentioned the three submarines that popped up out of the ice. Um, and if I'm, my memory serves me right, they also uh, demonstrated how to launch torpedoes under the ice and also the new motorized brigade on ice of Russia. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the air-to-air -air refueler above the polar area. So a Russia that is indeed asserting itself, that is indeed flexing muscles, and that is basing its long-term economic development policy with partners like Russia, uh, like China, um, with a modernization of its military equipment. Well, in front of that, I believe that it calls for increased investment by allies. And going back to paragraph 81 that you quoted, I know that the US is making particular efforts uh, along those lines as well, together with other allies. But I took good note, and I did read, by the way, uh, the US um, Army Arctic strategy, and I believe it is extremely interesting indeed. I apologize. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to note that our president, um, Representative Connolly, is here, and I would like to bring him to the floor to say a few words. Thank you, Ethan. Um, and thank you, Chairman Turner, uh, for uh, your wonderful work on this committee. And uh, what a fascinating presentation. I had the uh, privilege of doing a counterpart presentation in the political committee a few years ago. Um, and, I, you know, I, I do think this is a subject, along with the next one on China, that NATO needs to spend a lot more time focused on. I think historically, we've sort of ceded concerns about the Arctic to the, the Arctic Council. Um, and by doing that, we have sort of taken our eye off the ball of Russian military buildups in the Arctic. Um, if you take a bird's eye view of the Arctic, uh, it is dramatic, right? Russia dominates the Arctic as a literal state uh, by far. And uh, it is very clear that while their main impetus could be economic, they're more than prepared to back that up with a military posture that is now expanding. 
and I do think that it warrants NATO attention. We can't just say that's an Arctic Council issue uh, any longer. Um, I also believe uh, we're going to talk about China next, but I, 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 you know, China's involvement in the Arctic is quite dramatic. Uh, it's gotten itself sort of semi-official status, even though it's clearly not an Arctic state. Uh, it's talked about the constructing large-scale presence in Greenland, for example. Um, it is clearly, as you just pointed out, Mr. Lassonier, uh, you know, it, it, it could cut shipping time, uh, in some cases, six, seven, eight days from China to other of its export customers uh, if they can use the Arctic. Uh, and the fact that, uh, that that's being done with um, Russian assistance is also quite instructive for a you know, uh, an alliance of, sh of democratic societies and communities. Uh, and so I, I think it's really important that we, we pay a lot more attention to the Arctic than we have historically in the past, and likewise to China uh, as a hegemon and as a country that is clearly um, taking a much more aggressive posture than it has in the past. And the alliance between Russia and China is not accidental. It may not last forever because of cultural and political and historical differences, but the fact that they are colluding and cooperating on a number of fronts right now, including this one, uh, is something, again, NATO cannot afford to ignore. So I think, I think uh, the, the work being done today by this committee is, is, is not only substantive, Mr. Turner, uh, but I think a, a, a real step forward in making a contribution to our deliberations, not only as NATO PA, but for NATO itself. Uh, so I commend this work, um, and I wholeheartedly support paying a lot more attention uh, to the Arctic. And I, I guess I'd end, one of the things we also need to pay attention to is our capabilities in the Arctic. Uh, you know, if we look at the United States, for example, as a world power, our capabilities in the Arctic are pretty anemic. Uh, search and rescue capability, very, very limited. Uh, ice breaking capability, very limited. Uh, and so our ability to extend uh, influence and to protect interests, very limited. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, during the Cold at, at the end of the Cold War, the Arctic became kind of this backwater uh, of concern. And I think, frankly, uh, under Vladimir Putin, we need to reassess that. So at any rate, I really think this is a contribution to our, our collective thought, um, and I really uh, commend it. So thank you so much for having me and allowing me to speak. And again, Mike Turner, thank you for your leadership on this important committee. Mr. President, thank you for joining our, our committee and participating today, and thank you for your leadership of the NATO PA in what has been very difficult times. You've led us through into a, a, a great process, and we also look to your leadership when you get us all back together again. I know you've you certainly voiced that as one of your largest priorities, so thank you. Uh, Ethan, uh, our next questioner. Yes, um, I'm going to attempt to use my Icelandic. Thorgerdur. Katrin Gunnarsdóttir from Iceland. Thank you, Ethan. Do you hear me? Fine, excellent, thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, also, uh, but especially I want to um, start by congratulating you, Mr. Lassoner, for uh, your informative uh, report and expressing my contentment to see that uh, the security challenges here up in the high north are now the, the attention of the committee. I stand uh, currently host the chairmanship of the, of the Arctic Council and uh, the 12th uh, ministerial meeting now will, of the Arctic Council will be held uh, now uh, this week and now the, it will mark the end of our two years of Icelandic uh, chairmanship uh, term. Um, it will uh, now this uh, meeting will provide an opportunity to review the Council's accomplishments under uh, Iceland's chairmanship, as well as to see the Russian Federation now assuming the role for the next two years. It will be very interesting. 
Greater access to the uh, Arctic is driving increased attention to the region from both Arctic and non-Arctic states. And I believe we are all aware that the region is now becoming increasingly important in its uh, strategic, environmental, security and economic dimensions. And uh, as I know, and we all now know the first meeting of, of Secretary Blinken and, and uh, Foreign Secretary, um, Foreign Minister of, of Russia, Lavrov, will take place now this week in, uh, during the Arctic Council uh, ministerial meeting here in, in, in Reykjavik. But uh, what are we facing? And, and you uh, expressed it very well in, in your report. Russia has put increased focus on militarization of the region, and, and China has, over the, the recent years, instituted a, a gradually expanding set of scientific research programs in the Arctic that clearly have both civilian and military appli uh, applications. Uh, hence, it can be argued uh, that the Chinese uh, Libera, People's Liberation Army is increasingly utilizing scientific research as a means of entering the, the Arctic, describing such, such uh, activities as not just a matter of science, but uh, serving a dual purpose, as, as we know. So what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to specifically uh, express my sincere worries uh, watching China and Russia expand and increase uh, there are uh, activities here up in the, up in the uh, Arctic and up here in the north of the Atlantic. So in the light of these recent geopolitical uh, developments and our uh, common goal to keep the region of uh, a low tension area, not to a low tension area, I want to stress the importance of NATO's increasing role and uh, it's a need for a clear policy, for a clear policy on the high north. And, and Jerry, I commonly, uh, I completely uh, agree what he said here earlier. It's not just a matter of, of the Arctic Council, it's fine, but it's uh, a very important uh, role of, of NATO as well. And thank you, thank you all. Mr. Lester, may have lost our reporter. Jean Charles, tu que vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, oui. We hear you. Alors, je ne sais pas si vous me recevez. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, wholeheartedly thank uh, President Connolly and uh, our last uh, speaker as well. I, I agree. Um, there's a lot of attention uh, drawn uh, to the region and investments are important as well. And that's what the report highlights. President Connolly and uh, the delegation from Iceland have uh, highlighted the importance of uh, Chinese investments in the region. I don't know if it's necessary to uh, dive into the details of these aspects. Of course, we're all very well aware of what is going on. I started talking about it at the beginning of my presentation. You have rare earths, uh, which attracts a lot of attention, uranium, for example. And we know that Iceland is strategic for Russia and for China. I'd in fact like to, to thank the Icelandic delegation for all the attention it draws to this topic and the energy uh, it uh, deploys within NATO to make sure that the alliance as a whole really has a consolidated, uh, consolidated strategy on the high north and the Arctic region. Uh, as part of the assembly, we were lucky to visit a certain number of facilities in uh, Kivjavik, for example, uh, during one of our uh, visits. I think many of us still remember that. It really enlightened us on the new investments made by Iceland and by the Alliance in the region, uh, especially uh, around the uh, PA. So I'm very much in line with your comments uh, today. And of course, I'm open to any other questions if there are any. Um, la prochaine. Yes, we have another question from Fernando Gutierrez from Spain. Uh, 
I think we've lost Mr. Gutierrez. And we will try again. It looks as though um, Mr. Azgarov from Azerbaijan is attempting to take the floor. We'll try and take him up. And he'll be followed by uh, Cédric Perrin from France. No, unfortunately, we still have the same problem with the audio. So I, I would suggest the question or statement could be sent to, to me, the secretary, and I can distribute it, um, and or if it's short enough to put into the text box. Thank you. And our next question is from Cédric Perrin. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, so good afternoon. Uh, Jean-Charles, uh, hello. We no longer get opportunities to meet, so there we are. I'd like to congratulate you for this very interesting report. I know the topic well. In 2015 for the Senate, I'd written a, a report on the geopolitical uh, consequences of climate change. And of course, the opening up of new maritime routes was one of the questions we addressed. But it was still relatively quiet in that area at the time. Uh, it was still a very hostile environment, but clearly ch things have changed very much since then. I follow it closely, but I don't have the same level of information as you have. Clearly, China is very much interested in the area. In 2015 already, China was uh, showing some interest for the region and for shortening, of course, uh, the uh, shipping ways towards uh, Europe, uh, in Russia, a certain number of uh, channels that they want to uh, control. Maybe that's something you can get back to. And Mr. Connolly raised this earlier on. You have uh, ice breaking, uh, tourism, which is uh, increasing in the area, which can lead to uh, preoccupations. Now, I wanted to get back uh, to uh, the most northern territory uh, where there is uh, scientific research, but where Russians are present as well. They have a couple of coal mines to justify their presence uh, there. So could you maybe talk about Russian uh, presence uh, there? I think since 2015, the situation has really evolved. And could you maybe talk about, talk about Russian icebreakers as well? Um, I know that they're present in this very hostile environment and to be present there, they have to have the means to do so. So what investments do the Russians uh, make to have this advantage from a capability point of view? And then, of course, um, the increasing presence there has an impact on the very fragile ecosystem of the Arctic region. So from an environmental point of view, what are the risks? I know that some have tried to exploit uh, oil reserves. It hasn't always succeeded, but it's something that people are something that people are thinking about. So you have some information on that. Because of course, when you think about the Arctic, you also think about the environment. Anyway, well done for your work. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cédric. Thank you for your questions and uh, for showing uh, this level of interest towards the region. I know that you know the region well. Maybe a couple of general comments before I answer your questions. Russia's strategy towards the Arctic, a couple of things have already been said, but I would like to add the following to that. Of course, you have to think about the Russian strategy in a vertical way, uh, north south axis, if you like, uh, which covers three strategic points. You have the Arctic north at the north, then you have the eastern flank of the European Union or the European territory, and then you have the Black Sea in the Middle East, the southern point. Clearly, if there were to be tensions, these wouldn't first and foremost appear in the Arctic region. That being said, the strengthening, the buildup of Russian forces there contributes to this global buildup uh, that Russia shows um, in these three strategic areas. 
along this axis, this vertical axis. So you have to look at the military buildup as contributing to a more global strategy. Of course, some very concrete steps were taken. Um, a certain number of troops were trained by Russia in the high north, and they then went to Syria. So that's just an example. So you have this complementarity and a general overview that you have to keep into account. The Arctic region isn't isolated from the rest of the Russian uh, strategy. So that's the first point. A second, you talked about the Svalbard uh, region. Of course, the legal state is, is uh, somewhat uh, particular. We have various countries that have scientific presence there. Yes, there's recurrent uh, tension in the area, linked to uh, fishing rights, for example, and that's nothing new. It's something that uh, we see quite regularly. On research, there's some tension as well. People wonder what uh, others are doing there, what they find there. This leads to uh, tense discussions between the countries present in the area, uh, Norway, Russia. Dialogue can be tricky sometimes uh, on uh, questions related to research. So the Svalbard, uh, yes, has, uh, there's a lot at stake there from a geopolitical, geographical point of view, from a scientific point of view. So again, the status uh, there is uh, somewhat uh, special due to uh, the history. And yes, it's one of the hotspots in the region, if you like. And we have uh, these little tensions that appear now and again. So it's something we monitor very closely. Capabilities, icebreakers from Russia. Um, there's a bit of a continuous trend. Clearly, it's uh, the Russian fleet's specialty. So Russia has a clear aim and a clear ambition. It wants to modernize its fleets. That work is ongoing. It requires uh, large investments. It requires a considerable budget. The question is whether or not Russia can keep up this effort in the long run. But I repeat this once again, Russia uh, is uh, using uh, about a quarter of its GDP there. So it's clearly a stri strategic priority for them. And the modernization of uh, the Arctic fleet, generally speaking, will be a priority for Russia, uh, very clearly so in the, in the years to come. On um, maritime security issues, yes, it's, it's a key topic for two reasons. First, for economic and social reasons. This is mostly linked to navigation and to possible shipwrecks, uh, um, oil spill spillage, clear clearly increase an increase in uh, maritime traffic will have an impact on these questions. So the question is, is really very simple. Are we in this very hostile region and it will stay hostile despite these changes? Will we be able to help uh, ships, if they are in danger, to avoid a shipwreck, to avoid uh, oil spilling uh, in the Arctic, uh, the question really remains. We don't have an answer to that question. You mentioned tourism, cruise ships as well. Uh, cruise ships uh, get bigger and bigger. And again, uh, we have to adapt our rescue uh, solutions to those new ships as well. When you're dealing with uh, oil tankers, uh, cruise ships, of course, these are huge vessels. So you need to adapt your rescue facilities to that as well. Right now, it cannot be said um, that the neighboring countries could really deal with uh, some sort of major crisis on a uh, cruise ship with uh, thousands of passengers. So yes, this is something that will require investments. And in it would really, we would really recommend increased investments in those fields. Uh, thank you very much. No more questions. John Charles, thank you for a great presentation um, and uh, for your answers and responses. As with all of our reports, 
Um, if you have additional questions or comments, you can contact our rapporteurs or uh, Ethan uh, directly if as we proceed with these reports, you have additional questions or, or issues. John Claude, John Charles, thank you so much, uh, so much uh, for being with us today and for your, your great work on this. Uh, we're now going to go on to our China report. Uh, so I'll give uh, Laura Martino um, a uh, opportunity to um, request the floor. Uh, this is the consideration of the preliminary draft report of the Subcommittee on Future Security and Defense Capabilities, uh, China's Defense Posture Implications for NATO, uh, which will be presented uh, by Laura. Um, Laura hails from Portugal, and we hope that she's requesting the floor. See that she has, and hopefully she'll be joining us. We look forward to your presentation and opportunities for questions. We have allocated 30 minutes for both this presentation and a time for questions. Thank Laura, you. thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, dear colleagues, uh, it's a pleasure to be um, with everyone today. And like most of you, I would have preferred to see you all again in person. Hopefully this will be the case uh, by the time we have planned to welcome all of you in my home country of Portugal this fall. Uh, this year, um, I was again honored to work with the Subcommittee on Future Security and Defense Capabilities, uh, this time focusing on China's defense reforms, growing global ambitions and implications for the alliance. At the 2019 NATO summit in London, member states recognized that China presented both opportunities and challenges to the alliance. After much uh, research for this uh, report, uh, I believe this recognition still holds true, though I would add emphasize on the challenges aspects of uh, the relationship. I do remain optimistic allies will find a way to make the most of the opportunities opportunities um, closer cooperation with China presents. Uh, colleagues, as I, I note in my report, a strong modern military is a central pillar of uh, Xi Jinping's China dream, which aspires to raise China's economic and culture, cultural uh, statues across the globe. Since coming to power in 2012, she has uh, drastically accelerated uh, reforms across the uh, People's uh, Liberation Army in order to make it capable of defending China's uh, surging global interests, interests which include a larger economic and geopolitical uh, presence in and around the Euro-Atlantic area. Uh, three key objectives encapsulate uh, the People's Liberation Army, modernization efforts, mechanization, informatization, intelligentization. If achieved, uh, she uh, believes the PLA will become a world-class fighting force by 2049 in time to celebrate the centenary of the PRC. Over the past decade, uh, the result of Xi's uh, China dream on the People's Liberation Army has been remarkable. To emph emphasize just a few metrics, China now allocates up to 261 billion US dollars a year towards military spending. The Chinese Navy has surpassed the United States in the number of ships. It now numbers 360 compared it to the US 305 and continues to grow. The People's Liberation Army Air Force has grown to become the largest in Asia and third largest in the world. And China's nuclear modernization and missile programs have been advancing at alarming rates. In fact, the People's Liberation Army launched more missiles for training and testing purposes in 2019 than the rest of the world combined. With all that being said, it is important to note that China's military does not pose an immediate threat to allies. However, China's rise is still nothing short of a sea change for international uh, relations. 
China now accounts for 80% of the world's GDP and its economic growth has allowed it to try and uh, position itself as a near peer competitor of the United States global power. And it is increasingly apparent that China is an over the horizon challenger who's expanding global economic, political and military interests are increasingly butting up against those of the lions. China's military ambitions uh, will increasingly uh, rub up against allied interests, the most in three key domains, sea, space, and cyber, which will challenge norms of, uh, for, for the freedom of navigation on the high seas, the ability to have secure satellite communication networks in space, and strategic competition and disruption when it comes to cyberspace. To the north of Europe, in uh, accordance with its global ambitions, China has uh, proclaimed itself a near Arctic state, as it had been mentioned today, and has made clear it wants a stake in the Arctic's future at, as it becomes increasingly accessible due to climate change. In this regard, China has invested in Russian energy projects, established research centers in Iceland and Norway, attempted to engage in rare earth mining in uh, Greenland, and is working with the Finnish uh, company to link North, Northern Europe and Asia via undersea communication um, cables. To the south of Europe, China has instilled an even more impressive presence. A regular Chinese naval engagement beyond its immediate shores only began in the 1980s, by, but by 2008, the Chinese began deploying naval forces uh, to the Gulf of Aden to fight uh, piracy, uh, piracy. And in 2017, China opened its, its first overseas military base in uh, Djibouti, one of many ports and naval facilities, collectively known as the String of Pearls, which dot the Indian Ocean and uh, project Chinese power. On land, the People's Liberation Army had over 2,500 soldiers deployed in 2020 on nine African peacekeeping missions. The Europe's East, China and Russia have cultivated a particularly close uh, friendship and strategic partnership both countries have common cause in pushing back against U.S. global influence in the liberal international order. China now regularly participates in Russia's massive annual military exercise, such as Vostok 2018, in which the, the People's Liberation Army provided 3,200 soldiers, an exercise which not long ago was meant to stimulate the defense, simulate the defense of Russia's eastern regions against a hypothetical invasion by China. Russia and China have also participated in joint naval drills of the Mediterranean, Flat, uh, Baltic, and Arctic. And uh, furthermore, Russia has uh, been willing to sell advanced S-400 air defense systems and Su-35 fighter jets uh, to China. In Europe itself, China has been actively engaging various infrastructure and connectivity projects through their Belt and Road Initiative. And this wide-ranging $3 trillion initiative is defining China's new global aspirations and seeks to establish economic linkage across the globe. China's Chinese foreign direct investment in the EU soared from under 1 billion in 2008 to 35 billion in 2016. And a key focus of the investments has been to create linkage for entry into the EU common market. China owns a controlling stake in the port of Piraeus uh, near Athens and hopes to make it the largest port in Europe and a gateway for Chinese goods entering uh, the EU. In order to facilitate the movement of uh, these goods, China has undertaken infrastructure investment uh, projects 
such as highway projects in Montenegro, Serbia, and North Macedonia, proposed upgrades to Black Sea ports in Bulgaria, as well as a slew of other infrastructure and energy investments in the Balkans and numerous other investments across Central Eastern Europe in particular. As allies are now increasingly aware, uh, the strategic interests of the Euro-Atlantic community are not immune from the increasing influence of China. As this report indicates, uh, Chinese strategic investments are flowing to all corners of the alliance and uh, on all frontiers. And as stated at the beginning of my speech, I believe China does pose both opportunities and challenges to our alliance. But our China policy must be more than simply that. So due to our diligent work on this report, uh, we have several key recommendations to propose. First, the alliance must seize upon the strategic opportunities of the NATO 2030 initiative and a review of the alliance strategic concepts to position the alliance as an anchor of regional and global stability and defender of values and ideals enshrined by the Washington Treaty, namely democracy, individual liberty and the rule of law. Second, build a clearer picture of the challenges and opportunities China's rise poses to allied uh, interests. Allies must continue to expand information sharing, political and military cooperation, and increase coordination about China's military uh, modernization through established channels within NATO headquarters. Allies must particularly focus on China's push to adopt and incorporate emerging and disruptive technologies across its service from quantum computing to AI to automation. Third, engage more closely with global partners and deepen relations with new partners in the Indo-Pacific region. NATO's extensive global partnership network can help the Alliance maintain and even strengthen established global norms in the face of future Chinese challenges. Working uh, to expand relations with other nations uh, in the Indo-Pacific, such as India, should uh, be a major goal for, uh, of the Alliance. Fourth, the Alliance must expand NATO-China contact. Currently, NATO's political and military dialogue with China remains re relatively minimal. A key issue allies can work on together to bring China to the table is arms control, as uh, we have also uh, talked uh, today. China's clear intention to expand its nu nuclear arsenal obliges to take on a new role as a responsible stakeholder in the collective effort to negotiate stability through arms control. And finally, fifth, the alliance must identify strategic vulnerabilities and shore them up against potential external leverage. The ongoing pandemic has demonstrated clearly that allies are overly dependent on external providers like China in critical areas which can make supply chains vulnerable and thereby threaten, threaten, uh, threaten effective crisis response. Allies can benefit from bringing investments in sectors such as technology, energy, commu communications, and strategic manufacturing back within the community of allies. So dear colleagues, this has been a very brief summary of uh, our extensive reports on China, which I hope everyone will take the time to explore further. And I would like to thank uh, to Ethan Carwin and his uh, team for the fantastic work and support on this uh, report. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering the questions you may have on this topic. Thank you. Laura, thank you. Thank you for your excellent report and work. We certainly hope that we all have the opportunity to come and see you at the annual meeting in, in Portugal um, at the end of this year. And that um, the, um, you know, as, as we all find all of our nations progressing toward addressing this pandemic. Uh, your report gives us a, 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 uh, a warning, if you will, of the uh, concerns of the rise of China, uh, its <clears throat> militarization, it's um, 
uh, world uh, view um, and the uh, combination between its economic power and its military power. In uh, section E, uh, paragraph 63 and 64, um, you talk of military civilian fusion. Um, and what you talk about there in those two paragraphs is the, um, the really the lack of a division uh, between the, the military uh, functions of China and its civilian um, goals and, and operations. We also know that, that part of the civilian side includes the political side, meaning that the, uh, the Communist Party uh, also um, uh, penetrates both its, its economic activities as, as well as, of course, uh, conducts its, uh, its military activities. We see that, uh, and I'm just going to continue to ask this question as we're waiting for people to queue in the request list, because I know there's a number of people who want to ask you questions on, the, on this China topic. We see this as of greatest concern in the surveillance society that they've implemented uh, in, in China, uh, where individuals find that data uh, is used uh, both uh, in, in their daily lives, their commercial lives, um, by the government itself. As Chinese technology proliferates around the world, uh, that military civilian fusion and, and the surveillance society has even a greater concern because what we know is individual and personal data, government data um, is, um, is freely used and accessed uh, by the, the Chinese government. Um, you don't really reference that uh, in Section E, and I know in, in your, your readings and in, in your work and your work with Ethan, um, that's something that you, you certainly have come across. A number of our, our um, uh, member nations are struggling not only with what do they do or what does NATO do with rising China, but also what do they do on the commercial side, certainly with Huawei mm -hmm. um, and with, uh, with 5G. Uh, I was wondering if you thought that it, it might, might bear uh, some notation in Section E of the concern on the economic side that we should look to in, uh, in our individual um, nations' dealings with China and China technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a really great question. Uh, of course, uh, it, it's a concern for all the uh, all countries of the um, and the the surveillance of the society, the implications that uh, the economic uh, and the investments of China in the different countries. I think that we can explore more uh, this con this concerns and the implications uh, of. Um, uh, 5G and other investments that are made in uh, the different countries, because we see these investments uh, through almost all the countries, and and particularly in Europe, uh, we see that uh, China has uh, invested uh, a lot, and uh, so I think this is an issue that we can explore more to see what are the areas, the impacts of the investment, and what are the concerns that. Uh, our countries have to look uh, more closely uh, uh, in the future regarding uh, China. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Laura, thank you so much. Ethan, on to questioners. Our first questioner is from Italy, Andrea Orsini. Please, sir, you have the mic. Buonasera. Grazie per la interessante. Good evening. And first of all, I would like to thank you very much for this extremely interesting report. You have provided us with uh, some data with regard to the uh, military buildup that uh, China is uh, engaged in. And uh, the um, information you shared uh, is uh, very worrying indeed. Now, setting aside actual numbers, I'd like to ask you the following question. Would you say that there's also something to be said about the quality of uh, China's uh, uh, build-up? Would uh, the quality of what it's doing be such as to uh, put it on a par, let's say, with the West uh, in terms of a possible confrontation? Um, if we look at the situation uh, in the Soviet Union, we know that in terms of numbers or quantity, the Soviet 
Union had uh, obviously um, more weapons and more uh, boots on the ground than Europe, but the quality of these systems uh, was uh, uh, far less advanced. What could you say with respect to China? Would you say that China is also able to deliver in terms of quality and uh, uh, technology on the basis of the data that is at your disposal? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, well, what I can uh, tell you is that on the research and on um, uh, all the, um, the articles that we read, um, we see, a, how can I say, a preoccupation, uh, a concern uh, for uh, quality and determination of quantity. So the, they are very focused on the quality more than uh, the quantity. They want to uh, create um, a world class of force by 2049. So they are investing a lot uh, quantity, but not um, without quality. I think uh, um, so this has been a concern uh, regarding the Chinese uh, and the China dream. They want uh, to have this um, world class fighting fighting force uh, by uh, the celebration of one, uh, the P PRC one uh, centenary. So um, this is really a concern for for since and regarding everything that uh, we have uh, read, uh, this is a concern regarding China. They really are focused on quality uh, in uh, the investments they are making uh, uh, in the military forces. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have no questions remaining. Laura, thank you so much uh, with your work thank on you. the, the China report, as uh, was stated with the other reports. Uh, we know that you'll be working on this as we go to our annual meeting, and members are encouraged to um, make additional recommendations or questions uh, directly to you or uh, through Ethan. Uh, but we uh, appreciate uh, your work on this and look forward to hopefully seeing you in Portugal. Thank you. I hope to see you to all in Portugal. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we have just a few other administration items. Um, obviously, as a result of COVID, our uh, travel has been limited and may be limited in the future. However, uh, our subcommittees still uh, have worked to identify uh, potential travel opportunities uh, for their members. So I will list those opportunities, but uh, as we know, uh, all the members must be patient as we uh, work through what COVID restrictions uh, will be. And I know Ethan will be in touch with the, each of the delegations uh, and members to, um, uh, to continue to provide you information as to what will be forthcoming. So our subcommittee on transatlantic defense and security cooperation uh, have planned visits to Canada and Norway for later this year. Both countries remain enthusiastic about hosting a delegation yet this year, uh, but have asked for continued patience as we work uh, on COVID restrictions. The Subcommittee on Future Security and Defense Capabilities is planning a visit to both South Korea and Georgia. We're waiting confirmation for a request uh, about the requested visit to Korea in November, and they're working with partners in Georgia to find a suitable window to get uh, the visit off the ground to Tbilisi as well. The committee director, Ethan, will be in, in contact with all the potential hosts in the coming months, and will give us information about the latter half of the year um, and keep everyone informed. Um, the uh, at this point we'll open it up to see if anybody has any additional other business if you have anything you want to bring forward uh, to the committee uh, that is not on our agenda this would be a time to do so uh, seeing that no one has requested the floor uh, i'm going to assume that no one has any additional um, other business to bring before us so i will turn to the date and place of our next meeting our committee's next meeting will take place in Lisbon during the annual session, which is scheduled from the 8th to 11th of October. Uh, let's all keep our fingers crossed that we're able to actually make this journey, and we look forward to being in person again. I know each and every one of us have missed the opportunity to, to be together personally. So this concludes, unless Ethan has anything else he would, he, that we need to address, uh, the Defense and Security Committee. I would like to thank all of the members for your cooperation and your um, shifting to the uh, virtual world that we have uh, conducted the NATO PA through. Uh, I want to thank our interpreters who've done an excellent job in uh, all of this remoteness that we've had to deal with. Um, and I want to thank the, the NATO PA staff for all the research that they've done and have worked diligently to try to make this possible. 
Uh, it certainly does show while we've been virtual uh, that the staff have been able to be the glue that keeps us all interacting and work together. And we appreciate that they also have had to work under uh, very changing conditions, not just through the NATO PA, but even through their, their offices uh, and um, with their colleagues as well. Uh, with that, uh, thank you all, and we will adjourn. Ethan, thank you for your leadership of this as we have now, uh, you know, all around the world held our defense uh, committee meeting. So thank you. Thank you for your leadership, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone else. Have a nice Excellent. day. Have a wonderful day. Take care.